Uh, my name is Jess Hammond, for those who don't know me, I know many of you do, and a big welcome to you if you're watching online this morning as well. And currently I am the worship pastor and have been on staff um, for about 17 years on and off in different roles, different capacities. My husband and I, Dan, have been part of the community for 20 years. Can you believe 20 years in, in one place? You'll hear me share later that we, we were in YWAM, and so for, for a YWAMer to be anywhere for 20 years is a miracle in itself. So um, I'm going to graciously let Tim follow up. He was meant to be speaking on the gift of speaking in tongues today, so I'm going to leave that one to him um, for another week. I'm going to just hand all that back to him. But we're going to continue um, exploring this series around the gift and the gifts. So this morning, I just want to share just a bit of my experience and my journey um, with the gifts of the Spirit, and also a biblical framework that um, helped me really understand, I guess, all the different gifts in the Bible and why God has given us these gifts, but what all the different gifts do and what they mean. So hopefully that is helpful this morning. But why don't we pray to start our morning and just invite the Holy Spirit to not only uh, minister to our hearts, but to be front and centre and um, I invite you just to, I guess, lean in with anticipation for what he might want to be doing in our midst, regardless of what I say or don't say this morning, that he would be at work in this place. Lord Jesus, we do thank you that you are the King of Kings, that you are ultimately still on the throne, even though many things in our world would try to suggest that you are not, maybe even things in our own lives would try to tell us that you are not on the throne, we affirm this morning that you are King Jesus still on the throne. And we thank you for this gift of your Holy Spirit. And we thank you for the gifts that you give us to be able to encourage and empower and draw us ultimately closer to you. And so we invite you this morning to be speaking to each of us, no matter where we are at in our relationship with you and where we sit on, on this concept of your, your gifts, would you just draw us closer? Would you um, embrace us with your love this morning? Would there just be a great sense of your love, your unconditional love and your peace here amongst us? And so we welcome your work here, Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name. Amen. So there are a number of passages that talk about the spiritual gifts in the New Testament, which we're going to explore. But firstly, I want to just look at this word gift, the Greek word which is used in the New Testament in all of these passages, which the Greek word behind it is charisma. And I'm sure you recognise this word and you recognise words that come from this word. But the word itself actually means grace in action. And it has these undertones of a divine empowerment from God, or a special endowment of grace. It's actually particularly an, an undeserved gift of favour. I don't know how you go when you receive gifts, especially gifts that are undeserved. I don't know what your relationship is with gifts. I remember um, having a birthday in, in COVID, a big, a big zero birthday. I'm not going to say which one. Um, but I remember not looking forward to it. And when the day arrived, um, you know, from, from basically 8 o'clock in the morning till 8 at night, this stream of gifts just kept turning up at the door and people had just done all these amazing things. And I just felt so overwhelmed and so humbled. And it actually was probably the best birthday I've ever had. But it's like this, what do we do with this, this idea of gifts, a gift particularly that is undeserved? And I think it's just really important that we, that we look at this word because when we think about the gifts of the Spirit, that's exactly what they are. They are a gift. They are something that God has in mind for us, a beautiful gift that he wants to give us in order to enrich us, to empower us, and just to, I guess, enhance goodness in our lives. And if we understand that these gifts are actually a good gift, it might help us approach them in a different way and actually be more open to receiving these gifts especially when we understand who the gift comes from. And I know Tim quotes this verse a lot from Luke 11. Which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? 
or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion. If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? And in, in another um, passage in the New Testament, the concurrent passage, it, it says the Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him. So these gifts are good gifts given from a good, good father. So if we understand that this is the heartbeat behind these gifts, I, think, I just think it's really important that we get that in our heads because it, it can be hard to grapple with something, especially something that's a little bit out of our own experience or something that can look a bit weird in its expression or look a bit different if we understand that the purpose of these gifts is to draw us into the goodness of a good, good father who loves us and wants the best for us. So some of you will know this and some of you won't, um, but I grew up in Tamworth. Who knows what Tamworth is famous for? Any, any takers? Country music capital of Australia. Hence why, you know, most of you know me as the girl with the guitar up the front. Um, so my dad's here this morning as well, not from Tamworth, but also a, a muso. Been playing a country gig last night, so... We try to keep it under wraps. I try not to, you know, let the country infuse too much on Sundays, but you'll see, you'll see glimpses of it every now and then. Anyway, I grew up in a, uh, a really beautiful Anglican church, and if any of you grew up in small towns, you know that uh, churches in small towns are just different, and the way churches work in small towns is different. You know, they all work together, they collaborate. Well, hopefully they do, but that was our experience anyway. And this beautiful church, really solid, biblically, you know, very, pretty traditional, but um, just full of beautiful, faithful people and people that really wanted to know God. But I don't actually know, and I can ask Dad later, he might have more insight, what our theological position was around the gifts of the Spirit. There are some churches, and as, as Linda mentioned last week, lots of churches fall in different positions around, around the role of the Holy Spirit. Some churches are what we call cessationist, which means the, they believe that the gifts ceased with the early apostles, with the early church. There are some churches out there that still, still believe that. We don't, clearly, um, and so uh, I don't know where our church stood on this But it, when I grew up. But there was, I guess, a sense of, of tension. I never saw, you know, speaking in tongues or words of prophecy. It wasn't overly... Um, part of our culture, but there was a core group of, of us, myself included, and a few other families, um, probably a lot that were in, involved in worship as well, who really had a desire and a hunger to encounter more of God, and particularly when it came to the corporate worship time, the gathered worship time. And so there was always this sort of push and pull tension between those that, that didn't want to go there and those that did, and the minister trying to kind of keep everyone happy, uh, you know, in the mix. I'm so sure you can relate to that. But I guess as I grew up, um, you know, I got to experience, especially as I visited other churches and other denominations, um, you know, I experienced other expressions of the spirit that I wasn't seeing in my church. Um, and there was this growing hunger and a, I guess a sense that there was more. There was something more of God that, that I wanted to encounter, that I wanted to experience um, and another really pivotal point in my early, um, I was a teenager by this time, we used to have um, teams of, of these, you know, I won't say smelly, but sometimes draggly looking, um, hippie looking young adults, these teams of, of YWAMers that would come to our church. So who's familiar with YWAM? Anyone? Everyone? Not everyone. YWAM is Youth with a Mission. It's a mission organisation, but particularly catered for young people exploring, exploring mission. So we'd get these teams of YWAMers coming to the church. And I was just so inspired, not by their smell, no, by, <laughs> by their faith. And just, I guess, the reality with which they lived and this genuine expression of faith that they brought to the place. And, uh, you know, we ended up sending some of our young adults to do YOM, and my youth leaders had done YOM. So yeah, there was a great sort of um, sense that there was, there was something more 
out there that I wasn't experiencing. So come 19, I won't say the year, when I turned 18, (laughs) you know, three years ago. um, Of course, I felt the call to go to YWAM, to come to Melbourne actually, which is as far away as, you know, from Tamworth as probably you could imagine, and that was probably another reason I wanted to, as young people do, want to get away and, um, and fly the nest, whatever. So, and it really was in my time in Youth with a Mission where I got to see this practical use of the gifts of the Holy Spirit in gathered worship times. And so Youth with a Mission is, is actually interdenominational. There's lots of denominations and you're thrown into this melting pot, lots of nations as well, which is just amazing. And you get to see just God do some amazing things. And so I would see, you know, some, some pretty wild things, you know, people giving a message in tongues and then interp- interpretation and, and then people giving words of prophecy and healing and, and all of these gifts um, used in really beautiful ways. In my experience, it wasn't forceful, it wasn't... Um, you know, over the top. It was just really genuine. And, and for me, I was encountering God in just, you know, a really unique and incredible way that I hadn't encountered him before. And again, for me, it was really all about um, a sense of his love uh, and growing in my sense of being his beloved daughter. That was always the fruit of, of the times of ministry in this time. And so I guess, you know, as coming out of YWAM, and, and even when we um, would travel to different churches in YWAM, we'd, we'd have these beautiful experiences, but then you'd go to other local churches, and even stepping out of YWAM into local churches, you, I experienced a dissonance, you know, around this particular way of worshipping, and how it was happening in, in other expressions of local church. And, you know, there was, for some, there was, you know, a bit of openness Perhaps it was a cautious, cautious openness. For some, there was just you know a bit of scepticism, and for some, there was just flat-out resistance um, to this idea of the gifts of the Spirit. And so I felt this dissonance, but I also felt really grieved because my experience had only been beautiful and healing, and like very healing, like transformational. There was amazing things that God did in my life in terms of some deep inner healing that needed to happen. And yet I was experiencing this resistance and I was, was grieved because I thought there's, there's something of the Father's heart that he wants to do. There's so much more of him that he wants to lead people into an expression, and encounter of, of him. And I was grieved because I felt like people were missing out. I felt like by having that resistance or having that hesitation, there was, we were missing out on so much more of what God wanted to do. And I can understand the hesitation and I can understand the reticence, especially if you've been in context, and some of you may have, where you've seen these gifts abused and you've seen damage and you've seen them go awry and, you know, cause all sorts of church splits or whatever, where you've seen the negative effects of these sorts of things happening. I can totally understand the reticence and the hesitation. And I think probably at the heart of the reticence and the hesitation is actually just a lack of understanding of where these gifts sit biblically and what their use is, Um, especially if we're in in a church where we haven't sort of jumped into using these gifts um, regularly. We really need to have a biblical framework for what these gifts are all about. And as the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 12, he encourages us to eagerly desire the gifts and as, as we will discover, the gifts that he's talking about are these supernatural gifts that we explore that happen in our, in our gathered times or our, our prayer times together. So we're going to look at the three different lists just in the New Testament. I, I actually think there's about six different lists and some of them overlap, um, some of the gifts overlap in all of the different lists. But we're just going to look at three today um, for time's sake. Um, So there's one in Romans 12, 5 to 8. There's one in Ephesians 4, 11 to 2. And there's one in 1 Corinthians 12, 7 to 11. And I actually think each of these three different lists, they form different, they're they're used in different contexts and they actually have different purposes. 
So I'm going to give them my own names, and these are just names that I've come up with because they help my brain uh, kind of put it in order. And this, this framework I came across when I, years later when I went to Bible college doing some study on the theology of the Holy Spirit, and it just helped me make sense of what I was seeing actually happen practically. So these are the three main lists. Romans is, is the personality gifts, Ephesians is the leadership gifts, and Corinthians is the dynamic or the supernatural gifts is what I just called them before as well. And I'm referencing a, a, um, a resource called 5Q, which I've found um, also you know, a similar um, unpacking is what I saw in Bible college. So you'll see, I'm going to use a chart in a little bit that actually is directly from 5Q. But from Nathan Brewer from 5Q says, the goal of all spiritual gifts is to empower you to serve others for the purpose of building up the church to make an impact in the world flowing out of a motivation of love. So the gifts are, yes, for us, absolutely, to draw us into deeper intimacy and connection, relationship with God, but they're also not just for us, they're for us to serve each other as God's people, to build up the church, to equip the church to be what it's meant to be, to make an impact in the world. So there has to be an outflow. The whole purpose of the ministry of the Spirit is to empower us to be able to take his message to the world. There's no point in us just getting, you know, fat and happy in our comfortable surroundings and just enjoying the Holy Spirit. The point is to take it out, take his love and his message out into the world. So the first list in Romans, which is the personality gifts. So in Christ, though we form, though many form one body, each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it's serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it is to encourage, then give encouragement. If it is giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, do diligently. If it's to show mercy, do cheerfully. So I call these the personality gifts because these gifts are, you're, I don't know, can you read the chart? If you can't read the chart, I'll try and talk you through it. Sorry for the uh, visually challenged among, among us. You can go back and watch it on the stream and make it as big as you need to. <laughs> so anyway, the, the first list they're actually given at birth. So these are gifts that line up with our personalities. And so often, we, you know, when it comes to serving, especially at church, it's like, oh, I, I feel like, you know, I'm, I can do hospitality or I can give or I can, you know, any of these particular gifts, they're actually connected with how God has made us. They're intrinsically linked to our personalities. And this is where this endowments of grace idea comes in, where God has given us a particular a particular something to give to the world. This is the gift that he has given us. And again, there's other lists that um, have broader, broader gifts than this, but I, they fall under this same category, the personality gifts, because we are all made in God's image. And so as we bring our gift to the table, we all express a, a part of God that only we can express. So it's so important that we each step into these particular gifts but I think these are the gifts that we hear about most often in churches. Whenever I've heard a message mostly talked about the gifts, I think it's these gifts that we're hearing about. And usually because we want you to get involved in something, right? Which you all have marvellously signed up for. Thank you for Serve Sunday. Uh, but because we want to empower. We want to empower God's people to function in the gifts that he has given. Given each of us, right? That's, that's what it's about. So that's the Romans list. The second list is the Ephesians list, and these are the leadership, the leadership gifts. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. So these are the leadership gifts. Sometimes you may have heard them referred to as the fivefold ministry gifts or the apostolic leadership gifts. 
um, or a, a pest or a pept. So if you use all the letters and abbreviate it, you get a pest, unfortunately. Um, but these gifts are particularly, um, they're vocational. So these, you might have even heard the office of a prophet talked about or the office of an apostle. So it's kind of like your primary mode of functioning. And so what we, what we read here is that God has given these gifts specifically, um, initially, for the empowerment of God's people. So, you know, a church leadership team ideally has all five of these gifts working together. And if you look at our leadership team, you'll probably be able to see uh, each five of these gifts represented in some form. Uh, and I think that's, that's part of an apostolic leadership model that God, God has given us. Um, but uh, you also see, because these gifts are given from birth, you know, you're born with this gift. So you can probably, it doesn't take much of a stretch to see how these gifts work in marketplace settings as well. You know, an apostle potentially in a marketplace setting looks like an entrepreneur, you know, a leader, a visionary leader type thing, or a prophet potentially looks like a songwriter writing, you know, amazing songs calling people to justice or, you know, there's, there are overlays into how this out, outplays in our world. But specifically, they were designed for the building up of the church. And thirdly is the list, which I think this series is actually talking about, what we want to be exploring more as a church. And this is the list in Corinthians. And I think it's important to say that um, this passage, 1 Corinthians 12, has this list. 1 Corinthians 13 talks about love and how to use these gifts in love. 1 Corinthians 14 talks about orderly worship and tongues and other things, um, which I think Tim will probably um, talk about as well. So you can see in the context of Corinthians that Paul's actually talking about gifts that were designed for our worship times, our gathered times as God's people together. So he says, To each one the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. To one there is given through the Spirit a message of wisdom, to another a message of knowledge by means of the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by that one Spirit, to another miraculous powers, prophecy, distinguishing between spirits, speaking in different kinds of tongues, and another the interpretation of tongues. All of these are at work of the one of the same Spirit, and he distributes them to each one just as he determines. So I, I call these the dynamic gifts or the supernatural gifts. And I, I think they're dynamic. I mean, dynamic, the word comes from dunamis, which means power anyway. But um, it also, because there's a dynamic nature to the way these gifts work. Uh, words of wisdom, knowledge, faith, healing, miracles, prophecy, discernment, tongues, interpretation, administration, and help. And so the way I've seen these gifts work, particularly in ministry situations, is they will, they manifest themselves. So they come to light as they are needed. So, you know, you might be in a time um, ministering and praying for someone and you, you get a word of prophecy or a word of knowledge for that particular person because that is what God wants to say to that person at that time. You might feel a sense to, to pray for healing because that's what they need. So... These gifts manifest themselves according to the need of what is happening in the room and what God is wanting to do um, in a particular gathering time. Um, and that's, the way, that's exactly the way I have seen them function in YWAM, in some of our prayer and worship times, our encounter nights. Um, this is the way these gifts work. And this is why we need to understand these are, these are good gifts that the God, the God, God, our Father, has given us for not only drawing us into greater intimacy, but so that we can receive greater power in our own lives, but also greater power to be able to, to minister to those around us. They are good gifts. Um, and look, because they're supernatural gifts, they've got a supernatural element. Yes, sometimes they can look a bit weird and a bit scary. Let's face it, if you have been in situations where you've seen a manifestation of these gifts, there is a supernatural element to them, but these are the things that God has given us. And again, as we hear in 1 Corinthians 14, there are rules around how to use these gifts in an orderly way. But the fact that Paul has actually spoken about these gifts in use, it says that they, they were evident in the early church and we, we believe that 
they are evident today and that they are available to us today. So does that make sense, that framework? Um, and our encounter nights really are around exploring some of these gifts more deeply. So when we set a date, and it's the next one, um, we'll be sure to um, let you know because it is a great time and it's a very, I guess, safe space to step out in practicing these gifts. But again, in the same passage, 1 Corinthians 12, is where Paul says, eagerly desire the gifts. It's, it's one of the only things he says to eagerly desire these gifts because he knows the importance and the way that God can move through them. So I know the question then probably is, why? Why should we desire these gifts? And, you know, for you, you might be sitting here thinking, well, I'm actually really happy with where my relationship with God is at. And I feel like, you know, I'm pretty deep. I've got a solid foundation. I don't, do I really need these gifts? Do I need to step into some of these things? And I, you know, I, I had that similar experience around particularly the gift of tongues. And I won't share that today. I'll share it another time or if you uh, want to have that conversation offline. Um, you know, why, why, do, why does Paul say eagerly desire the gifts? And I think one of the main reasons is that there is always more. There's always more in our spiritual lives. We're, you know, we're on a journey, but there's always more, more of God that he wants to reveal to us. He is an infinitely powerful, majestic, beautiful, you know, we just can't even fathom the depths of our amazing God. And yet there will always be some things that are a mystery, but I do believe there is so much more of him that he wants us to know and experience and encounter. He wants us to know him in, in deep ways. And in my own experience, these gifts have really deepened my relationship with God as I've opened up, um, you know, even to things that are a bit outside of my experience there's been a deepening, there's been levels where God has actually just, you know, brought things to the surface that need healing, um, deepened my foundation, deepened my understanding of him. And it goes without saying that as we explore these gifts, anything that, you know, anything that happens in the realm of ministering in the gifts has to line up scripturally. There's no question. If it doesn't line up scripturally, then that's when we get a bit iffy about what's actually happening. So it all lines up with the character of God. And so for me, it really has just deepened my love for God, but also um, my sense of being known by God and also knowing him and just kind of like scratching the surface of, of understanding who he is. And so for us as his people, I, I really believe it's a gift for us corporately to be able to experience together. You know, we said on Vision Sunday, I, re- I feel like we're just scratching the surface of what God wants to do in these times um, because there is always more. You know, it's like being married to someone and as you grow, the longer you go on, we're 20 years married this year as well. Can you believe that? I can't believe that. We weren't child, child brides. I wasn't a child bride. I know, I know I look like it, but <laughs> anyway. I digress. But, you know, if, we, if, if I am still envisaging the Daniel that I married 20 years ago and I'm still in love with that person, it's totally unrealistic, right? We journey together and we get to know each other. And look, some marriages, I got, some relationships, some friendships do that and they hit, you know, they hit a wall, don't they? But we need to continue to journey and get to know each other, re-get to know each other, find out the more that we are created to be. And it's the same with God. Why, why would we settle for the relationship we had with God when we were 18? Or if you're younger than 18, when you were 12? You know, or if you're 90, when you were 70? Why would we settle for that revelation of God when there is so much more that he wants us to keep growing in? You know, we, are, we never stop growing. And so God wants us to keep growing. And so I think these gifts are a beautiful way in which we can keep growing in our faith and our understanding of God, but also our understanding of the way he works in the world. And to remember that mostly, you know, these gifts, first and foremost, are about drawing us into relationship with him. It's about getting to know him intimately. 
And so that's, that's a great thing to remember. And then secondly, secondly, why? Because we need them. We need these gifts. And as we go, if we went back to that first quote from Nathan Brewer, you know, he talks about the idea that, yes, God empowers us to serve others, to take out into our world. I mean, have you seen our world lately? Have you seen our world lately? Yes, there are beautiful things. Yes, there are amazing things going on. But the level of need in our world, and I don't know if it's just I'm getting older and I kind of see these things more, or is it an old person thing? I don't know. But, like, you see the need more and more. Post-COVID, you know, mental health battles are off the charts. And I'm sure you're all seeing it in your different contexts. Physical health battles are off the charts. Again, I'm sure you're seeing this in different contexts. Poverty, war, you know, injustice in the world, the list goes on. How, how far do we want to go with the list? God has given us these special gifts as a way to see his kingdom break in in a very special way. Because ultimately, as Tim has led us over these last couple of weeks with the Jesus and culture stuff, humans don't have all the answers. Even at our best, even at our most remarkable, our most genius, we will never have the answers and we will never be able to heal our broken world. We know that. We know that here, right? It's only Jesus who can heal our broken world. And I think these gifts do that in transformational ways, in ways that maybe we don't understand. But they're also ways that sometimes surpass our human efforts, surpass our human knowledge, because God is the one that has all the answers, right? He has all the resources. He is the source of all things. And so I really believe as we step into this next era, I, I believe we have stepped into a new era as, as humanity and as the church, you know, there's going to be lots of pretty hairy battles that we have to face as Christians. There's going to be lots of different things that come across our path. And so I believe that God has given us these gifts not only to keep us connected to the source, to keep us abiding in him, but so that we can see God transform lives, so that we can see healings, so that we can see mental health restored, so that we can see salvation, we can see people coming to faith, we can see the reconciliation of humankind, a world that just desperately needs Jesus, right? And so I, I really believe that we need to be open to stepping into some of these gifts, to allowing his power to minister through us in these ways. Um, and I know we already are on different levels, but I know for some of us, um, we're going to head to a time of communion as well. But I know depending on you know, your background and where you've come from, that there potentially are blockers. We all have different blockers in our, in our lives. For some of you, it might be, yep, I'm, I'm totally cool with all this. Let's just get on with it type thing. Um, but for some of you, there might be hesitation. And you know, for some, it might just be, this is, this is just really foreign. I've never seen how these gifts work. Um, I think it, you know, it's, all, it's all a bit weird. I've just never seen it done well. You know, so as we come to the cross, as we sit before our God, for you, if that's you, I invite you to just bring those things, bring those questions to God. Um, I encourage you to be honest with him and just say, God, I'd, I just feel really uncomfortable in this space, but I believe that you maybe have something for me in this, so I'm going to choose to trust you. That might be your prayer this morning. And maybe for you, there are actually issues around this whole idea of God is a good God that has good in mind for you. Maybe there's been hurts, maybe there's been things in your past or Maybe there have been things where you've actually really questioned, I don't know, are you good? Do you have my best interests at heart? Why should I trust these gifts if I can't trust you? That might be the question that you're wrestling with. And if that is, I would encourage you just to bring that to the foot of the cross again this morning and just honestly bring that to God. You might want to confess that to him, hey God, just don't feel like I can trust you actually. I'm sorry, but I don't. And allow him just to minister as you bring that to the cross this morning. The cross, which is the symbol, the very symbol of his love. 
his faithfulness to us. And maybe for you, there, there are just questions around, hey, I'm just totally freaked out by this whole thing. And that's totally valid. That's totally fine. And as Linda said last week, it could get messy. It, it does require a level of surrender. And maybe for you, it's like, actually, if I surrender, is God going to make me do something really weird, something that I'm going to be embarrassed by, or something that I can't control? Is something going to happen to me, to my body that I can't control? It might be that level of, of fear or, or concern happening for you. And that's very legitimate. But let me say to you this morning that this is not who our God is. Our God will never put anything on you or push you beyond what you invite him into. He is a gentleman. The Holy Spirit is a gentleman. And he will only work in a way that you have given him permission to. But it does require us to actually let go of the reins and to surrender. So that might be the conversation that you want to have with God this morning. Okay, God, yep, it's all a bit weird, but okay, I'm going to surrender because I know who you are from how I've seen you work in my life before. So we're going to have some space to do that this morning as we come to the time of communion and we remind ourselves of the core of our faith, this Jesus who hung on a cross, who gave his life, the greatest gift, the ultimate gift that our God has given us. Um, but I encourage you just to sit with those questions, sit with how you're feeling um, and invite God just to speak into your heart and to minister into those spaces. And then after that, we'll, we'll finish with a final song, but we might just allow ourselves to open our hearts and express ourselves a bit differently in that final song. I'm going to give you fair warning. I don't want to be worried, but um, come have communion. Just give your heart again to Jesus. Let him refresh you and realign your heart. And then we'll, we'll just have a time of worship where we can just respond to God however he leads. Does that sound okay? Yep. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the fact that you are a good, good father and that you do only have good intentions for us. And we thank you for the work of your spirit and the beautiful gifts that draw us into a deeper understanding of you. And we invite you as we take the elements, the juice which represents your blood shed on the cross and the bread which represents your body that was broken for us. We just invite you to be working in our hearts. Lord, would you show us the areas in our hearts where you need to dig a bit deeper or where we need to let go of control? We thank you for your deep love for us. And so would you lead us as we take these elements and remember your great sacrifice, your great love, and also your great victory on the cross. In Jesus' name.